Secrets and Spies presents Espresso Martini with Chris Carr and Matt Fulton. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Espresso Martini. Matt, how are you doing? Hey, Chris, I'm doing good, doing good. Excellent. You all geared up for your Thanksgiving? Yes, uh, I think as geared up as I can be. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not going too far. I'm not. I'm not cooking either. So I think I have it relatively easy compared to um, some people. Yeah. Oh, perfect, perfect. I miss. We used to many, many years ago. We used to have um, some American friends who lived here, and we used to get invited to kind of a turkey day uh, fest. And I and uh, I miss it. I really miss it. And um, you know, I think Thanksgiving is quite a nice little prelude before Christmas. Um, always liked the idea of it. And uh, as a English person, <laughs> English man, looking to you guys, thinking, God, they're having so much fun right now. And, and tomorrow, I'm at some conference. So There's like... nothing stopping you from doing. <laughs> It. <laughs> true like you true. can look up menus online and yeah, like you, yeah, just, yeah, you can yeah. just do it i don't know how easy it would be to <laughs> to, to buy all this stuff but no, no. Um, i'll just uh, get a turkey sandwich from pret that'll be my thanksgiving <laughs> sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Maybe actually they've run out of pumpkin spice lattes now, so I have to get an eggnog latte because uh, yeah, that's they, they they've stopped doing that now. So it's like oh, yeah, my goodness. <laughs> but there we go. They 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 stopped. Let me let me filibuster this here for a second. Mm, mm. They stopped uh, the pumpkin spice stuff here like kind of super early. Like I don't know. I feel like to me like November still kind of qualifies. Yeah. But, I mean, they also started in like mid August. You know, oh, did they? which is just oh, dumb wow. to me. Yeah, yeah, that is weird. No, over here it started September and it ended bang on the day after Halloween. It was gone. It was Christmas. Yeah. The second Halloween ends in the UK, it's Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Why are you putting like? Why are you putting pumpkin spice stuff out if it's like ninety degrees outside still? Like that's just yeah. that's evil that's to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Well, some people think pumpkin spice lattes are evil in themselves, but <laughs> it's my kind of evil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love them. <laughs> so, so pumpkin spice lattes and Thanksgiving aside. So on today's um, espresso martini, we're going to be looking at the potential hostage deal with Hamas. Um, we're going to be looking at a few articles on how people are still coming to terms with the Hamas attacks. Um, and that, that's, that, so we've got two quite interesting articles there that look at that. Then we've got the, uh, we're looking at the, how political dysfunction is growing to be one of the number one threats to the US. And um, and then we're going to wrap up with looking at the disastrous deal that led to Ukraine giving up its nuclear arsenal. Then on Extra Shot, which is our exclusive Patreon show that follows this, we will be looking at the growing tensions between Serbia and Kosovo. Um, we're also going to be looking at a ransomware cyber attack that's crippled the British Library. We're also going to have a quick look at TikTok's latest icon, and then we're going to wrap up on, hopefully, how to avoid conflict over Thanksgiving dinners and the Thanksgiving holidays in the US. And and obviously, those any advice there might be useful for Christmas that's coming up as well. So yes. uh, so to get access to Extra Shot, um, you'll need to be a Patreon subscriber. So just go to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies and pick the subscription level that works best for you so matt i think we'll, well first of all um so today's episode is going to be a little bit different um matt and i are both going to kind of take the lead at different points so so matt you're going to take the lead at the beginning uh, we've got a, your we've got an article about the hamas hostage deal so i'm going to hand over to you and then obviously you'll come back to me at some point when necessary <laughs> yeah okay so this is a very uh fluid situation i actually rewrote this section of the script four times oh, wow. just yesterday yeah, yeah, yeah. because it kept changing on me and i think it was like it was around like 11 it was like 10 11 o'clock last night here that the deal was announced so i know like you were already like down for the count and uh, so I found this good CNN write-up that had a lot of, like, well, first it was a New York Times article that I had that had, like, mm, the mm. initial kind of, like, details of the deal. And then later I found this CNN article that had a lot of, like, background on um, how the deal came to be involved. Uh, Bill Burns, the director of the CIA, the yeah. director of the Mossad, it all kind of negotiated together. And I, mm, I sent this mm. to you and I was like, I've been mm. up since 5 a.m. today. I'll deal with this tomorrow. So this is... Very fresh. We 
have um, in in principle an uh, agreed upon deal between Israel and Hamas, a ceasefire um, in exchange for 50 of the hostages that Hamas uh, uh, kidnapped. Um, so let me read through some of the details of the negotiations and sort of how the whole thing came together. So this is a really interesting um, article from CNN. It's by uh, MJ Lee, Betsy Klein, and Jennifer Hansler. And of course, we'll have links to all this in the um, show notes. But so uh, negotiations began in the days after Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. But the groundwork was laid weeks later after the Biden administration established a means of communicating with Hamas via Qatar. On October 23rd, the White House successfully secured the release of two American citizens from Gaza. On October 24th, Hamas appeared to agree to the parameters of a deal to release women and children hostages, but Israel wasn't convinced and began its ground invasion on October 27th. In the weeks that followed, the U.S., Israel, and Qatar went back and forth with Hamas, negotiating with the group about every detail of a possible deal. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken returned to Israel in early November to press the Israeli government to accept humanitarian pauses, but it took days of pressure from the U.S. for the Israeli government to institute and acknowledge tactical pauses. A major breakthrough came on November 12th, when Hamas finally relented in offering identifying information about several dozen hostages. On November 21st, Israeli Prime Minister uh, Bibi Netanyahu approved the deal, so that was, that was yesterday, uh, and the Qatari emir passed the text of the agreement to Hamas for the last time. On Tuesday morning, Hamas responded to their Qatari uh, interlocutors, and they approved the deal. Uh, the deal only returns 50 women and children, but U.S. officials are confident that it will ultimately pave the way for additional hostage releases. There are 10 Americans who remain unaccounted for, including two women and a three-year-old girl who I believe is orphaned. I don't know if she was orphaned in the attack, but an orphaned three-year-old girl is among the hostages there. Um, the White House remains determined to get everybody home. Uh, an agreement to release hostages from Hamas would unlock the potential for delivery of more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. After their safe passage, the released hostages will be given medical attention in Israel then there will be efforts to repatriate citizens to their home countries and connect them with their families. And a couple other uh, details about the deal that were reported yesterday before it was announced. I'm not sure if this is actually in the text. So a couple a couple details for about um, the deal that I haven't quite seen so far this this morning, but um, I saw this uh, reported a bit yesterday. So. Um, in exchange for the 50 hostages released, for, for each one, um, Israel will release three Palestinian prisoners. So that's up to like 150 um, Palestinians that they'll release. I think there's going to be, so it's a, it's a, a four-day uh, ceasefire. They're supposed to release something like at least 10 hostages a day. Um, and for every 10 extra hostages that they release on top of that 50, I believe that potentially opens the possibility for an additional day to the ceasefire. But I think Netanyahu said something to the effect that he's not he's not sort of holding out hope that that'll happen. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and yesterday, I saw some reporting, too, that part of the agreement would include a... Um, daily six-hour stand-down of Israeli um, ISR drone flights mm. over um, northern Gaza. Um, and I'm not sure if that's still in play or not, but it was it was reported as a um, something that Hamas was going to get uh, yesterday. Um, so that's sort of, yeah, that's kind of yeah. what we have right now. Mm, I'm sure, mm. I mean, this is still, uh, yeah, like I said, I rewrote this four times yesterday and even this morning. And I'm sure by the time this episode is finally released and you guys all listen to it at home, There'll be more information out that we don't have right now, but as of this moment, uh, Wednesday morning here anyway, that's that's what we have. Yeah, the only no, the only uh, extra bit of information I've spotted just whilst you're chatting is apparently Hamas say the pause um, in Gaza fighting is to begin at 10 a.m. on Thursday. Right. Um, so I'm assuming yeah. it's 10 a.m. local time to Israel. Um, so that's that's something. So I mean, my initial reaction to this is, thank God there is a realistic and viable deal happening because I can't mm -hmm. stop thinking about these hostages. I think I said this before. Every time I see um, a kid just sort of playing around, my mind immediately goes to the hostages, and then more recently as well, the terrible airstrikes that have been going on in response yeah. to the Hamas attack. 
Um, you know, so much blood has been spilled in the space of, was it six weeks now? It's unbelievable. It's been 40, um, 45 days, yeah, I think, since the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and from what I read as well, just make sure I've got this right, is mainly is women and children being prioritized yes. as our sort of quote unquote foreigners. Um, so so uh, yeah. nationals of other nations are being prioritized too. So yeah, so, so that's good that that's happening because as you mentioned with that, uh, that young girl, there's quite a few children who have been taken and um and it's just the whole thing's appalling and i think my mind also now um you know goes to i'm still very disappointed by the lack of concern for the hostages in those who've been actively campaigning for a ceasefire online oh, um, absolutely you know we're going to talk awful, about that in a bit yeah i've just seen endless ceasefire now but not a word about hamas or about the hostages and um, and then obviously we've seen endless videos of people ripping down the um, posters in in the states and in the uk um and in Europe as well, and I think the sort of lack of empathy shown to to the um, Israeli victims and hostages has just been a bit of a wake up call to me. You know, I, I find the whole thing quite um, disturbing, really. But uh, one interesting thing as well, you mentioned earlier the the drone flights, and I'm mm-hmm. intrigued by this sort of um, request to stop drone flights for six hours. That instantly makes me suspicious. Um, and I hope in the fine print that they specifically said Israeli drones, but didn't mention anything about American drones. But um, the yeah. US has been involved in the search for hostages, and they've been using uh, Reaper drones and Rivet joint aircraft. So I've actually seen on flight radar 24 my favorite app um i've seen forte 10 and homer 42 being redeployed from ukraine and they've been flying near israel um and um i assume they've been involved in those efforts and the just to let audiences know just in case the reaper drones capture real-time imagery and signals intelligence whilst the rivet joint which has a crew of 30 people that can detect identify and geo locate signals throughout the electronic spectrum so the rivet joint's quite good for figuring out the sources of certain signals whilst the reaper drone is just there really to pick up the signals um and also it has maneuverability so they can suddenly move it somewhere and follow someone or something um but the the rivet joint obviously has the capacity to spend um you know to look at things with a more microscopic level and figure out where things are so so that's interesting and the other thing is where you mentioned qatar has played a significant role and i'm still deeply disappointed that they allow the hamas senior leadership to operate Operate there and mm-hmm. be based there because um, most of Hamas's senior leaders aren't even in um, in Gaza; they're in no. freaking Qatar. Um, and and one of them in particular, I was just watching a video by Memory just the other day. Memory is the um, oh, I forgot what it stands for now, but Memory is a, a brilliant channel where they translate sort of um, Arabic uh, channels, specifically um, in regards to sort of terrorism and extremism, and they kind of translate into English what's been said in various news interviews. And you had the leader of Hamas who seemed quite happy to sacrifice Palestinian uh, civilians for his call. Yeah. Malcolm Nance said. Just talked about this beautifully on your mm. interview with him a couple of weeks ago. This sort yeah. of apocalyptic yeah. vision that they sort of expect Hamas expects Gazans to just sort of die for them. Exactly, you know? exactly. And and it's just this is the thing that again with all the protests as well meaning, and I put that very generously as well meaning and intention. Some of these protests have been, um, which I still have issues with. Um, they seem to always let Hamas off the hook um, and Hamas are pretty much a criminal organization it seems to be a big money laundering operation mainly to benefit a few people the senior leaders mm-hmm. to make an absolute fortune um, at the cost of of um, innocent lives in or should we say innocent civilian lives in Gaza and they seem quite content to carry on and very few people seem to very few people in the west because I won't hold it against Palestinians in Gaza because they're under duress but I think anybody who supports Palestine in the West and is not holding Hamas to account, quite frankly, is enabling Hamas. Um, and, you know, because we're comfortable, relatively comfortable in the West, and we have freedom of speech, and you should be able to hold Hamas to account. And if we're not doing that from our comfortable position in the West, then what the hell are we doing? Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so those are my main thoughts on it all. And I really just hope, um, I mean, from what I'm seeing as well, it's still obviously not all hostages. So I'm hoping, to, I'd like to see, because I think the number that's been floated, is it 50, then 10 a day? Is that what you were saying? 50 is part of the deal mm. for sure. Yeah. 
um, staggered over the four day ceasefire. Mm. Yeah. And for every 10 additional hostages they release beyond that 50 yeah. equals an extra day added to the ceasefire. Got you. Is Got what you. I believe the yeah. terms yeah. are. Yeah, so there's two, there were 250, well, uh, 250 plus taken, right? Because um, that number keeps has changed a little bit, and then unfortunately, some have been found dead. Four, um, mm. four have four have already been released previously, yeah, right? I think at least yeah. two of them were uh, dual U.S. citizens, mm. yes, um, yes, yes, and then and that then, older lady as well, right? And then I think two, I think two were found dead inside the al-shifa hospital mm. um and i don't know that it's i mean it's assumed that they were killed by hamas i'm not sure if that's mm. if that's confirmed there's another yeah. there's another woman um who hamas released a video of sort of like pleading for a ceasefire mm. and then at the end of that video there was a a photo of her her dead she was deceased God. at the end of the video and Hamas claimed mm. in the video that she was killed in Israeli bombing, but take mm. that for what you will. It's Hamas saying it. Yeah. Um, yeah but yeah. that's sort of, I think, what we what we understand of their mm. status so far. Mm. And that's an interesting kind of point, actually. One of the big problems of kind of getting proper information on the ground from Gaza is the fact that Hamas are obviously the ruling body um, and they're a terrorist organization and it's very difficult to take their word for anything and it obviously we talked before about the hospital bombing that originally was blamed on Israel that turned out to be an Islamic jihad rocket misfiring mm -hmm. and hitting a car park and in fact I don't think anybody really died in the end even though it was originally reported 500 it was killed. a few it was mm. a, I think it was at least a dozen yeah it wasn't yeah. it wasn't 500 it wasn't close no. to 500 Fun. No, definitely, and and that that story went around the world like two or three times, and and I I think even now that it's still people believe the Israelis bombed that it's hospital. Still out there, yeah. There have been several other airstrikes over the last mm. forty five days mm -hmm. that that did kill n numerous Palestinian civilians in a single swipe. There was um. A refugee camp that they, uh, the Israelis said there was a Hamas commander that mm. they were targeting, and and numerous Palestinians were killed as collateral in that in that strike. So that account with the hospital that set off that night of protests all across the Middle East mm. that had me mm. really freaked out that night. That wasn't the Israelis, but there were other instances of stuff where, where mm. it, it it was. Yeah, yeah, and I I think even when all the sort of um, dust does settle. I'm sure the the death toll won't be too far off what we, we think it is on the civilian level. I think um, it's uh, right now it's thought to be about thirteen thousand. Yeah, it's ridiculous. There's so mm -hmm. many people have died, and it's yeah. um, and I think you know just talking wildly, bombing the bejesus out of somewhere really. It's <sighs> the most densely populated strip of real estate on earth, mm, and it's like a yeah. it's like a quarter to a third the size of Los Angeles. It's not yeah. that big. No, no. You know, like with my chat with Malcolm Nart and stuff, it's military operation and stuff. But I think the problem is, it's a bit like um, sending in the FBI to deal with a hostage, hostage situation and being willing to kill like 60% of the hostages just to get the hostage takers. I think the, it's a bit crazy, really. Well, you raise an interesting mm. point there that um, the families of these hostages mm. have put enormous pressure on the Israeli government to do everything they can to get them out. Mm. And there's been quite a lot of chatter out of people around Bibi Netanyahu that are sort of willing, that have been kind of willing to just write these people off, these hostages yeah. off as like sacrifices. You yes. Know? Like, no, yeah. we got to we gotta turn Gaza to, to, mm. to mm. glass and, oh, well, okay. Mm. And um, Itamar Ben-Gavir, who's a, a far-right Israeli politician, he's their... Um, Minister of National Security. And I mean, before BB needed to sort of make multiple deals with the devil to stay out of prison, Itamar Ben Gavir was basically a domestic terrorist yeah. inside Israel. Jeez, um, yeah. And uh, he yesterday was, um, and people around him were lobbying hard against this deal. And I believe when the National Security Cabinet uh, voted to approve this last night, mm, he voted mm. against it. Mm. Um, a couple others did too. He wasn't the only one, but he's, mm. I know one for sure who did, which I think is just completely fucking disgraceful. Like, could yeah. you imagine like, 
like Lloyd Austin or now David Cameron, you know, oh God, like you yeah. had 250 yeah. Americans held hostage mm-hmm. somewhere mm-hmm. and someone mm-hmm. on the cabinet was like, no, I mean, you would just be, they would be run out of town. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think they should trade him over for a couple more hostages. Oh, yeah. I know. That would be, <laughs> that'd be interesting. <laughs> It's a bit like um, how AI could probably replace a lot of studio executives. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! But yeah. Uh-huh. So um, I, I, met, I know you mentioned earlier the the drone flights are of interest to you. Yes. Was there anything tickets stood out? There? Yeah. So I haven't seen this reported anywhere, but of course, so it is. It is said. Yeah. There's a six hour daily stand down of Israeli drone flights. I asked on Twitter yesterday. Does will that include? I don't think it will, but does that include U.S. surveillance flights? So yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm sort of guessing here. I mean, so you have this stuff on on flight radar that you're tracking the the, the rivet joint and mm. the Reaper Jones and stuff. I think there's probably a lot more. I mean, I would guess. Oh, there would that be. There's yeah. stuff that 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 isn't pinging on on mm. on flight radar that, oh, that they don't want yeah. you to see. Yeah, I have my backup app for that one, but. <laughs> People that I text, hey, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think about this? Um, I would guess. I mean, so Central Command, European Command, Special Operations Command, or I mean, Israel and Gaza is sort of at like the fault line between mm. where Central Command and European Command's area of responsibilities overlap, and JSOC is involved for contingencies with the hostages. So that's so calm, all kind of in the soup. Together, all operating, I think, numerous unmanned and and fixed wing um, assets. You have um, the Gerald Ford uh, strike group off the coast in the Eastern Med, which has a um, wealth of capabilities on that carrier and on its mm-hmm. on its um, on its escort uh, uh, ships. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't really. If the Israelis are technically standing down for for six hours a day, that doesn't necessarily change anything um i'm not also you figure gaza is so geographically small especially Mm. northern gaza is Mm. where Mm. even if a drone isn't technically flying over northern gaza that doesn't mean it's just over the border in israel or out to sea and its sensors and its cameras and stuff aren't looking into gaza Mm. you know Mm. what i mean yeah it's like sort of like peering over the fence you're you're still looking into mm, you know mm. and i bet there'll be some satellites involved in that too because oh, yeah. i think you could probably use like seismic data and things like that to probably help figure out tunnel use and where tunnels have been and stuff like yeah, that. yeah that's uh i think falls under uh geospatial intelligence so that's a lot of like um hyperspectral uh imaging mm. um and 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 whatnot that that we're pretty good at um nro the national reconnaissance office operates all kinds of weird stuff like that up in orbit that we don't know anything about. Yeah, so I hope, I hope in the fine print of the agreement that there's some <laughs> somebody somebody hasn't considered who's got drones that could keep in the sky just yeah. to, <laughs> to stay out there. No one, I hope no one told Hamas. Yeah. Hey, what about this <laughs> that you didn't ask for? Yeah, exactly. I mean, also there's an RAF base right there mm. in um in Cyprus, in yeah. Cyprus. It's like a hop mm. over the water there. Um. The nice the the ninth recon our ninth reconnaissance mm. squadron has operated um a detachment of U twos out of there since the since the seventies yeah um and I believe since the attack uh, JSOC has staged a bunch of stuff out of there mm. yeah it's a very handy place to have yeah. a base I think so uh, and uh, funny enough a good friend of mine's moving out to Cyprus soon, so <laughs> he's he's perfectly positioned for this sort of stuff. <laughs> Yep. but there we go yep. um so yeah no it's it's some interesting stuff there so um yeah this will be sort of developing but hopefully from 10 a.m tomorrow that'll be the first of a few pauses in fighting um and uh one can only hope that this is the beginning of a more positive way of uh kind of moving forward and and um bringing the violence to a close but um i won't i won't hold my breath that it will lead to that but one can always hope for that um so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we'll see i hope it's i mm. i hope the time is used to allow as much meaningful aid into mm. gaza as possible um i i know you know bb sounds very cynical as he is wont to do um yeah if we can get more than 50 out 
um, and add more days onto this. Mm. I, I, I hope we can do that. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I, I hope this is used as a platform to sort of de-escalate things and and to build on this with further further measures. Because I've thought for a while that, that it's high time that this is sort of brought to a responsible close mm. in some way. I mean, that mm. doesn't mean that like Israel just packs up and walks away and lets Hamas rearm and we wait until the next time. But this is not what's we have now. It's just not mm. sustainable. Mm, well, no, exactly. And this is, there's a, yeah, the bigger point there is obviously Hamas rearming. Um, the fact that they've managed to arm themselves in such a way um, over the last sort of few years is pretty appalling, actually. And, mm-hmm. you know, like the way they've been using um, water pipes as rocket launchers, etc. And even we talked about before, the actual weaponry they used in the attacks um, was, you know, it would, they were, you know, I think I said this last time, um, in Gaza and the West Bank, the most popular kind of gun is a homemade gun. It's made off a design known as the Carl Gustav submachine gun. And during the Hamas attack, they weren't using those. They were using like AK 47s, AK 74s. They were using yeah, like M4s and M4s. stuff. Too. Yeah, they were using proper stuff. guns. And so, yeah. how the hell did they get them in? And, you know, you mentioned before, it's probably the rat lines, um, potentially on the Egyptian border. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there do need to be some serious questions about that on top of that um i know online there have been a lot of people very critical of both the un and some of the ngos that have been operating out of there and have they been turning a blind eye to things um i'm not qualified to answer whether ngos have been turning a blind eye to things but um certainly with the sort of amount of weaponry and stuff that's managed to be smuggled through or um, even just some of the reactions to the hostage taking and things like that, you do have to wonder what is going on with some of these NGOs and stuff. But uh, I, but yeah. I think I, I think there is warranted criticism and, and concerns to be raised there. I think also the concerns, the, the, the mission of the NGOs, these humanitarian NGOs, whether that's UN agencies, other nonprofits and stuff, that are operating in Gaza, their mission is not to defeat Hamas and ensure mm. national security. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not making excuses for them. I'm just no, explaining no. what their yeah. mission is and what their thought process is here. Their mission is not to defeat Hamas and and secure uh and 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 ensure Israeli national security. Mm. Their mission is not to prevent Hamas from coming over the Israeli border fence that the Israelis essentially left unguarded. Their job is to provide humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza as best they possibly can under a government Mm. that is a terrorist organization, Mm. right? Mm. So there's that factor. And there's that, certainly that, that, that duress there. Um, I think, yeah, the, these agencies have different concerns than the Israelis. That said, there is some warranted concerns and, and, and criticisms about what they know and what they're mm. saying publicly mm. versus mm. what's actually happening and what they're seeing, you yeah. know, as far as that Al Shifa hospital is concerned mm. and elsewhere. Mm. But I think a lot of the criticism that we've seen in recent days that like um, the UN is Hamas, the BBC oh, yeah, is yeah, Hamas, yeah. like that's yeah. stupid. Like yeah. knock it off. Stop yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's 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 how I feel about that. Yeah, there's definitely there's always there's always a especially on the political right in the US and the UK is always a bit of an anti UN sort of stance on things. Sure. And the UN um, is difficult really because its its mission is to sort of um, try and create a dialogue between everybody um, and uh, <laughs> to to do that. Um, Unfortunately, if everybody has an equal say, it means very little progress will probably happen because you end up with stalemates, and that's what happens. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, fact, the, yeah. the UN system is just broken. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not quite sure how one fixes that. But at the same time, I think a world without a UN is not necessarily a positive thing either, because as dysfunctional and imperfect as it is, at least we've got one. Um, and something as dysfunctional and and um, and needs of sort of bit of uh, love and attention can be fixed um, or could be reformed. But if you just keep sort of ending and destroying things and not rebuilding, which is what will happen if somebody says, right, we're getting rid of the UN, I can guarantee you there won't be another one. Um, no. You know, not in uh, our lifetimes. Um, no. And that would be a bad thing. I mean, we saw what happened when the League of Nations ended. Um, so it's, it's yeah, we definitely need a UN. But um, at the same time, I think 
there's been a lot of um and i don't know if it's fair or unfair but there's been an awful lot of criticism of israel over the years driven at the un and i think sometimes there's been um there's been a lack of criticism towards groups like hamas um and i think that the international community does bear some responsibility for allowing things to kind of get to the point of where they've got to um and i think there needs to definitely be a bit of soul searching about how better to deal with hamas and how better to deal with um the palestinian leadership um both in gaza and the west bank and how to kind of and also how to put sort of necessary pressure on Israel to kind of come to the table as well um, and have a viable peace process because it kind of feels like that's been totally ignored for decades. Um, but the blame's always been thrown at Israel for that and never at the the Palestinians in any way, shape or form. So I think some soul searching needs to go on to, because the UN is supposed to be there to kind of be the vehicle to help uh, drive compromise and peace because like with the IRA with the Good Friday Agreement ultimately it's just a load of compromises and there are many people today who grumble about it um some with justification you know there's a lot of um IRA members who got away with murder um mm -hmm. and then at the same time in Ireland there's a lot of now scrutiny on the security services who once fought against the IRA and there's a bit of disproportionate kind of um witch hunt going on for people in the security services but not members of the ira so yeah. uh but ultimately for as imperfect as the good friday agreement was and obviously it's still fragile thankfully we've not had a consistent ira bombing campaign since about 1998 99 no, um you get the there's odd been a few murders yeah. and flare-ups and stuff yeah. but it's nothing exactly but it's nothing being like on the level it was before and, and obviously you've got we've got factions who you know, who who want to start it off again, um, and they do things, but thankfully most people realise they're just a faction yeah. and um, put them back in their place. But that's kind of what peace and politics is. It's messy and it's imperfect and it's all about kind of ultimately about compromise. Um, so, and I think when we get to political dysfunction, we'll see how well that's going, but... <laughs> But there we go. Well, I think this segues nicely into a piece that I found in the New York Times by Patrick Kingsley, which was titled, For Years, Two Men Shuttled Messages Between Israel and Hamas No Longer. So um, Gerson Baskin, an Israeli peace activist who we actually talked about in our previous episode, and a man named Ghazi Hamad, a senior Hamas official in Gaza, they both maintained a secret line of communication between Israel and Hamas for 17 years. They nurtured an informal back channel between officials in Jerusalem and Gaza, even though both sides refused to engage with each other directly. Their relationship helped end several rounds of violence between Israel and Hamas, and despite the recent conflict, which started on the 7th of October, um, in which Hamas raided Israel, their relationship managed to endure, including discussions about a deal to release hostages. However, on October the 24th, Ghazi Hamad publicly justified Hamas's assault in Israel, and called for additional attacks leading to a fallout between him and Gershon Baskin. The impact of the recent conflict has shattered the idea of a perpetual containment of the Israel-Palestine conflict without resolution, displacing millions and bringing the region to a brink of a regional war. Both Baskin and Hamad had initially believed in the possibility of a long-term truce or peace between Israel and Hamas, but their views have now changed and now with Baskin calling for the removal of Hamas. So I think this piece kind of perfectly shows how complicated it actually is to try and bring peace between these two groups um and yeah matt i don't know if you had any sort of thoughts on this bit to me this just seems the whole story just seems so sad i don't know if you felt that way reading it yeah just very kind of yeah just sad and 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 depressing these you know two men from opposite sides of the tracks as it were um who for years have kind of had this back channel and this this friendship i guess you could you could call it that um i mean saved gilad shalit's life for sure and um you know who knows what else kind of prevented just from having that back channel there um and i think to me just sort of underscores and we're going to get into this a bit more in the next topic but just underscores the particular kind of ugliness of this this flare-up right this conflict um that that this relationship would be a, a casualty of it uh as well and there, there there's a bit in this article that talks about how um Hamid maybe wasn't the 
moderate he was made out to be. Yeah. Um, and I know he also has, uh, he's he's not currently in Gaza um, and has, you know, relatives and friends and stuff who have been killed and that are still there and that, you know, perhaps, I guess, someone understandably colors his kind of personal feelings and and reactions to the conflict, at least right now, you know, while it's still ongoing. Um, but yeah, I just found that it's just very, very sad and underscores how ugly and, and depressing this particular moment is, which I don't know that it's felt like this before, mm. or at least that mm. I can remember. Yeah, it is, it is very sad. On the Hamad not necessarily being um, the moderate he presents himself as, I, I think sometimes there is a... Just just thinking widely for a moment, um, sometimes there is a sort of phenomenon when you feel like you're making progress, you start to assume the other person you're making progress with is sort of fitting your image of them. Yes, like a desire, or like a like a desire to have like our man in Gaza, quote unquote. Yeah, and and I think you got to be one must always be mindful to be careful of that sort of mm -hmm. syndrome, whatever one calls it, our oh, man in Gaza syndrome. We'll call it that. <laughs> You know, um, yeah. and it's interesting because I've been also reading um, just on Twitter, etc. I've been reading about sort of the, a lot of members of the Israeli left who have been pushing successively uh, for years, uh, pushing their right wing governments to prioritize peace initiatives who now after the attack and the sort of sheer brutal violence, of the attack and then seeing the international negative reaction towards Israeli victims they're now. Yeah questioning their beliefs they're questioning even if peace is possible and there was even a great interview on michael weiss's is it foreign policy podcast where um one of his guests was talking about how um you know we tend to look at israel with a very western lens but he was saying that israel's sort of becoming much more middle eastern in the way it approaches things yes it's also i think this is a misconception that mm. Many people in the West, at least the United States, have too. Yeah, like like you said, this desire to see Israel as a Western country in the sort of North American European model, right? But it's 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 Israel's not a democracy. It's a it was never created that way. It was created mm. as a Jewish state, mm. and there's always been that kind of conflict at its at its heart. We saw that flare up a lot in the summer with the pr protests against Netanyahu's government and stuff. It's like. Is it a democracy or is it a Jewish state that has to kind of adopt these hardline apartheid policies to mm. enforce that? Mm. Well, yeah, I think I've seen some commentators say it's a it's it obviously always started out as a Jewish state, but the intention was for it to become a democracy. Um, it's what a lot mm. of leftist um, uh, Israelis I've spoken to have sort of said it was always the ambition, but obviously in practice, especially with successive right wing governments, that really hasn't yeah. worked out. Um, so yeah, it's very, it's, yeah, the Israeli politics is a very kind of complicated affair. And I think also a lot of people try and simplify it for various agendas. I mean, I've, I've spoken to Middle Eastern family members and friends who just try and paint all Israelis with one brush. And just because Netanyahu's in government means every Israeli believes and follows Netanyahu. And that's not the yeah. case as we saw with those protests, you know, and as somebody else pointed out, quite a few of the victims of the attacks were members of those protests who all wanted peace so i yeah. think um the sad fact is i think this hamas attack has really ruined the peace process for generations because also i mean like if this if i were in israel and should we say you know the attack happened next door and i survived whatever i and and then you know like with the hamas spy story we talked about a few weeks back where basically people who were like the gardeners or local right. people would turn out to be sort of supporting Hamas. Yeah. I find it very difficult to trust anybody again. Oh yeah. I don't know that I ever could if I lived in one of those no, towns right near no. the border. I could never, never. Yeah. The mistrust that this attack has caused is just damaged the peace process. I hopefully not permanently, but I think it will I, I think it'll take decades for people to even consider trusting each other again. And and with what we've seen with the protests and stuff, I kind of feel like there doesn't seem to be the nuance in thinking about this yes. situation anymore. Yeah. And that's the other issue. I mean, I was gonna say, like, I think that for the last couple years, mm. it seemed like you look at like the Abraham Accords, you know, which were essentially a series of incentives for the Arab states, like the Gulf Arabs, to normalize relationships with Israel in exchange for what essentially amounted to an arms deal, right, frankly. And 
as part of that was kind of this belief that the Palestinians could be like, you know, fenced in in their open air prisons and just ignored and the rest of the region would kind of normalize and move on without them. And this attack shattered that notion, yeah. you yeah. know, that that you can kind of have peace and stability in this region without factoring in millions of people who live in abject squalor and misery in these open air prisons um that have been you know forced out of their homes and stuff mm, for mm, decades mm. um and I, I think if there's potentially anything good that comes from this conflict i mean maybe it's and i've seen israelis say this too that like okay, we have to solve this, you know, like the status quo that we have, mm -hmm. that this mm -hmm. kind of all these people living in in, yeah, in, yeah. in limbo right on our doorstep just just doesn't work, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it has to be solved. The only, the only other sad thing, just thinking, it just sparked off my mind, he was saying that there's still outside actors who have a role in all this as well, who have a desire to keep this going on. Um, yeah. Because the Israel-Palestine conflict, first of all, helped a lot of dictatorships for decades, you know, because yes. Israel became the, the boogeyman. Um, uh, you know, we talked about this before, like the spy scandals, etc. It helps Saddam Hussein in Iraq. It helps Iran. Um, Iran. And it certainly has helped in Turkey. We've had spy scandals just in the last election. There was like yeah. a so-called Israeli spy ring, which then vanished. Um, yeah. And certainly with the, you know, there is an Iranian connection to what happened um, with the yes. Hamas attack. Um, and there's potentially even a Russian connection to Iran because Iran is a client state of Russia. So... Any peace process is going to have to confront that as well. Um, or people are going to have to get wise to realize they're getting manipulated by, you know, the Iranians and the Russians. And even, you know, there's an American angle too with the support for Israel and stuff as well. Um, and depending on which American government become you know continues on will determine how that goes. Because with Trump, yeah. he, he they completely ignored the Palestinians. He would let Netanyahu and the Inamar Ben Gavirs of the world turn that whole place to glass and not think yeah. twice about it yeah there would exactly. just be no discussion about it yeah just kill them yeah. we don't care yeah yeah and that, that's the huge difference in the policy between sort of the democrats and the republicans at this time yeah one is at least trying it's not perfect yeah. they might not be doing they might not be doing enough fast mm. enough yeah but they're yes. trying exactly <laughs> whereas the exactly. other guys will probably actively help yeah. the worst factions of the israeli government mm. murder as many palestinians as they possibly can that's yeah. your choice. Yeah, yeah. Well, their, their solution would be sending Jared Kushner. <laughs> right. And that didn't really amount to much. <laughs> so Yeah, the, 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 yeah. that's that like smarmy douchebag from Die Hard who sort of goes in yeah. and says, let's make oh, yeah. a deal, Hans. <laughs> Bobby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm your white knight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. That would be it. That would be it. So, yeah, this is the thing. So, um, yeah, the road to peace is a rocky one. Um, and I just... I don't know. I'm just wondering now whether successive generations um, have the nuance to deal with all this now. Because I feel like we're kind of, the, the world is sort of, the Western world at least, is changing a lot. And I think yeah. nuance, is, nuance and satire seem to be the victims of um, a lot of the changes that are, are kind of occurring. And patience, yeah, yeah, totally. You know, uh, I mean, I, I can relate to when I was in my 20s, I used to get very frustrated. Why do things, why are things so backward as they are? Why do things take as long as they do? Um, and over time, you, you kind of grow to learn. That's just sadly the way certain things are. And sometimes there's a reason things take a lot longer than you want them to. Uh, and sometimes there's a good reason, not always, but sometimes. Well, do you um, think that's yeah, something yeah. that just changes that just changes? I mean, so you're sort of the generation ahead of me, mm. right? And mm. I'm the gen, I'm solidly millennial so there's gen z behind me yeah that are kind of definitely in that moment right now and i kind of see my generation moving in in your direction as well a bit so i don't know do you, do, do you think that that's something that sort of any every generation just just evolves yeah. in that direction i think it does actually yeah i think it does because i was gonna one i was gonna put a bit of um defense for generation z in a bit but um, yeah. <laughs> so um with the bin laden thing but i think what tends to happen i think in your early 20s you kind of get this massive not only you know, once you leave education, you kind of suddenly in the, the real world suddenly and it hits you like a ton of bricks. Um, a lot of things that you kind of 
sort of uh, idealistically taught in school, you soon realize don't actually work in the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think also as more and more, should we say, life responsibilities kick in, you know, you end up in a significant relationship, you know, you may or may not have kids, your priorities change and suddenly um, you start, I think by your mid thirties, you start to realize stability is a good thing um <laughs> because because i think Ryan in your 20s now, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly because in, in my 20s i mean god i was a 9-11 conspiracy theorist in my 20s for a bit and and um you know and there was a lot of uh sort of very far left stuff that for a while was appealing like you know we did change the system do this do that all these very wide ideas um and and then over time you realize actually pff, that's not going to work and then you start to look at some of the people who are calling for these things and you realize that these people if they managed to change the system they would make a far worse system um and so yeah i do i do i not completely but i do think there are quite a few people who evolve um now some people might turn say that that that's actually not evolving it's um it's sort of the opposite of evolving, um, that you're just sort of, I don't know, um, falling in line with the status quo, because that's always olds. considered... Yeah, it's going to considered a bad thing. But I think, yeah. realistically speaking, um, I think status quo is a little bit better than constant revolutions and political upheaval, because we see that in other yes. countries. And I don't mean to sound like I'm being judgmental, but, you know, if you look at recent history and political turmoil in the middle east and stuff you become more and more grateful of the political stability even at how imperfect it is in the west you know we we have elections every five years um we don't have a, a revolution every five years we don't have tanks and people storming parliament every five years and, and in many respects that's a good thing <laughs> i mean i think i think that's certainly true mm. of my generation i think has sort of come to like the realization like can we just for once in 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 our lifetimes at least just kind of chill the fuck out yeah you know yeah. i mean so we me and people of my age were you know children in the 90s yeah which was like the happiest time at least in recent memory you know like there's that joke in like the original uh matrix which was made in like 99 or whatever yeah, like yeah, yeah these machines you know uh uh set humanity back at like the peak of our civilization it was 1999 we we're like yeah, yeah. yeah they might have been right about that yeah you know yeah, yeah. the 90s did feel good as a t i'm glad i was a teenager in the 90s because it did feel good <laughs> right and then sort of just when we are, our brains were sort of forming we watched mm. three thousand people be murdered on live mm. tv yeah and then all these wars in the Middle East. And then once when we sort of came of age and had to go into the job market, the economy imploded. Yeah. Um, and then we very nearly had uh, fascism in this country that we mm. may still deal with. Yep. Um, and then we had a, a uh, once in a century pandemic. And I think we're just kind of exhausted now and yeah. like can we oh and also yeah our parents and grandparents could buy a house with the change in their couch cushions and that just seems like a fantasy for us yeah you know like can we i think where we are now is like can we just chill the fuck out for a while yeah and not do the upheaval and the revolution no totally my favorite meme that articulates that so well is a picture of matthew mcconaughey inhaling a cigarette i think it's from true detective and he looks yeah. very stressed out That's very and, much and honestly yeah I, being a millennial has not been easy it's been I, everything you've just said is exactly what happened i'm just a few years ahead of you and experiencing those things i remember mm -hmm. 9 11 vividly i was like 20 i just literally days before seen dr strange love for the first time so when you suddenly see the pentagon on fire because something <laughs> hit it you're like fuck man this is yeah. world war three about to kick off yeah and it really felt like that for a few hours um so yeah so i do i do think over time you know and this there's an interesting point tom nichols made online actually because with the a lot of the people in these protests, these sort of pro-Palestinian protests, we put them, who have then indulged in anti-Semitism. There's a good percentage of people probably within those groups who are caught up in um, de-individuation, which is when your individual identity disappears and you form on a group identity. And um, you want to, and when, when you're in your 20s, you kind of want a sense of belonging uh, i think right. everybody wants a sense of belonging but in those situations there's a sense of belonging and suddenly people 
participate in bad behavior because they want to belong to something they want to belong to a cause they want to be seen as being just and they don't realize the consequences of some of the things that they've done because like anti-semitism is one of these weird things where if you're not jewish and you don't study history it's very easy to forget it even exists um and i think like with the 9-11 move and i didn't even pick up on any of the anti-semitic stuff until a lot later and you like start to realize that these conspiracy theories about the illuminati as actually potentially talking about jewish people i yeah. had no idea of that and i think quite a few people who were 9-11 conspiracy theorists who thought there's a secret group controlling the world had no idea that it was meant to be Jewish people or something. Well, like when you say George Soros, you mm. mean Jews. You just yeah. don't necessarily have the yeah. balls to say, I yeah. think Jews run the world. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And even even George Soros has been blamed in some way for what's happened. I just saw right. recently his foundation had paid for some um, charities in Gaza that somehow have being connected to something to this and suddenly it's george soros is controlling everything and it's like oh my goodness so you don't a lot of people unless you study history quite prop you know properly you don't a lot of things can pass you by for years just because you don't have the um this i suppose where culture comes in because culture changes so much i mean like i felt in my 20s i always felt like i was just constantly catching up um there was always like 20 movies i'd never seen it was always like uh millions of musical albums i'd never listened to there were so many kind of cultural experiences people talked about that I'd never even been born around i went through was significant in my yeah. sort of early to mid 20s i remember there was a summer in particular yeah. when my my dad and he, he he died when i was 10 but had oh, a yeah. whole bunch of old yeah. like albums and stuff you know from the 70s and 80s yeah. and everything yeah. i sort of went through a phase of just listening to like all that stuff yeah you know where i just had to kind of like catch up and download that exactly exactly yeah. and even now i when i speak to people who because in my my sort of day work i deal a lot of my, the people i work for are a lot younger than me and i remember once we would um i was filming this video because we really have got off on a tangent but it, it does yeah. relate. but it does <laughs> relate fine. but i was filming a video once and and um and and we had this black van that looked a bit like the a-team and, and i remember saying to the presenter why don't you stand that van and you know um, you know, think of Hannibal and the A team, and he got exactly what I was on about. But the the client who I was doing this for thought Hannibal was Hannibal Lecter, so it's like, why are you telling him to be Hannibal Lecter? It makes no sense to me. <laughs> yeah. and, it was, <laughs> and then I had to explain what the A team was, no. and it's little things like that. So, so that's the kind of fun side of culture. But there's a obviously when it comes to history and stuff, there's a whole. I mean, like I had a conversation in September with someone who. Um, wasn't even born when 9-11 happened. They're studying politics. And then they even asked, um, they, you know, and I, I I don't think they meant this in a bad way. They just asked of, um, you know, did we overreact with 9-11? You know, it, yeah. ultimately they put it down to mathematics, which always sounds colder than they meant it to be. But she said something on the lines of, you know, ultimately only 3,000 people were killed. Um, but the thing is, it's just like it's the way they were killed. It was the, the mm -hmm. drama of it and all that. The, the visibility you, it's of it. Exactly. So twenty years later, it probably is easy to say, "Well, only X amount of people were killed. Why did we go and end up on a ridiculous war that you know um, endured for twenty plus years and stuff, um, and yeah. maybe created more terrorism than we had in the first place?" <laughs> you know, I could understand the the criticism, but at the same time, you got to understand where it kind of came from is i don't know it's the thing it's the interesting thing between generations and so um yeah yeah <laughs> yep yeah <laughs> i have no idea where that ends up but anyway yep. <laughs> well should we uh, should we move on to um all my life i've watched violence fail the palestinian cause i think that links in nicely tie yeah. up our uh talk of israel palestine for this this episode yeah all right, so there's a um, this I thought was a beautiful and honestly very hopeful essay um, mm. in the Atlantic that was published recently. Um, it's by John Aziz, who's a um, British Palestinian artist and writer and musician. Um, and yeah, he he penned this essay um, in the Atlantic. Uh, it's called "All My Life I've Watched Violence Fail the Palestinian Cause," and here's a few key points from it. it says growing up with Palestinian heritage. Uh, Aziz experienced a dual cultural upbringing in England and California, mm. where he was immersed in Palestinian traditions during summer visits. Um, amidst extreme reactions to Hamas's attack on Israel, he's felt a sense of isolation within the Palestinian community 
due to instances of anti-Semitism and calls for the dismantling of Israel at pro-Palestinian rallies. He acknowledges Palestinians' uh, historical grievances, such as the Nakba in 1948, which is sort of their term for the dispossession of being, you know, kicked out of um, yeah, yeah, all the settlements in what's now Israel, where they used to live, uh, and their ongoing daily challenges, such as the loss of their land, property, and lives. Um, initially taught to view Zionism as settler colonialism, Aziz's perspective evolved as he admired uh, nonviolent figures like Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and Nelson Mandela, leading him to see compassion and humanity as paths to freedom. Later in life, Aziz learned about Jewish suffering, including their own persecutions in the Holocaust, leading to an understanding of Zionism as a defense mechanism for self-protection. Aziz emphasizes the historical ineffectiveness of violence in advancing the Palestinian cause with a focus on the failure of rocket attacks and terrorism to bring territorial gains or improve the political and economic situation. Advocating for compromise, he recognizes the legitimacy of both the Palestinian and Zionist causes. Despite feeling hopeless after recent events, Aziz received support for his desire for peace from, from both Palestinians and Jews, and the essay concludes with a dream of Israel, of Israelis and Palestinians choosing a better mm. path after the conflict ends. Mm. What would you think about this, Chris? I thought it was a really good piece. What's great about an article, I think that he points out a really good thing, that both sides have legitimacy. You know, yes. there is, and there is a need for compromise and humanism. And he uses that term humanism a few times in the article. And I don't think he means humanism as in the organized humanism. I think he means it more on just a basic human level and understanding. Um, and I think that is the ultimate way of getting ourselves out of this is to because the problem is at the moment, I think, with both with the pro Palestinian side and sometimes the Israeli side too, is that both of them like to delegitimize each other. Mm -hmm. um and that's the problem and yep. as long as they keep doing that we're never going to get anywhere um and somewhere along the line both of them are going to have to sort of uh, understand the valid sides of each other um and then move forward from there um so yeah. so yeah so I, I i think that was a very good article um i don't really have much more to add to it to be honest because i think we've I've probably I've, i think i've spent some of my talking points earlier but i think one of i think as i said earlier the biggest problem at the moment now is the growing mistrust on both sides because of the october 7th attacks yeah. i think that's going to take generations to deal with um i think yep. i mean i think too uh, that i've honestly like when we were sort of prepping this episode, mm. I said to you in an email where we were sort of looking at the list of articles that we had, I said to you that I've honestly been sort of the last few weeks have been very kind of mm. just checked out and and took a break from it, even like domestic U.S. news. And I would I, before this, yeah, I got to go. I got to go get up to speed again. Um, I mean, I was I found it just the conversation around the conflict so exhausting after a while mm. and mm. i mean in 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 the beginning i was really following it beat by beat and everything and i found it really kind of just getting to me like i said before yeah. there's a particular ugliness about this that feels different you know the mm. stuff on college campuses and yeah i mean like a couple things i saw in particular that just really bothered me like there's a uh Israeli social media influencer. I don't even know her name. I don't honestly don't give a fuck what her name is. But um, she was sort of doing like this Marie Antoinette-esque cosplay of a Palestinian woman in Gaza being bombed and sort of like living in the rubble and posting that on her social media as sort of like this kitsch, you know, oh, this is fun, which was just so fucking disgusting to me. And and on the other side of that, there was this video that I saw that I, I, I saw this and and wrote this whole like drafted this whole like tirade on Twitter <laughs> that I was gonna go off on this mm. and and mm. eventually just deleted it and really like took a break from the whole thing for a while. But it was this video of um two it, this was in Montclair, New Jersey which is a uh, suburb of, of New York City, one of the most affluent towns in the country, right? Mm, mm. Um, these two uh, definitely, you know, fits the, like, straight out of central casting, um, you know, uh, uh, young Gen Z kind of, like, lefty mm. types who I guess had been spotted uh, 
tearing down posters of mm. these hostages, right, that have been taken and like tearing them up and sort of throwing them away. And someone saw them do this and I guess followed them to um and 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 confronted them filming them. They were then sitting outside of a a restaurant kind of like having brunch and could have confronted them like what do you, I don't know if, if 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 you saw this. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. It made me so angry and and confronted them about it. And they were just like, dude, can you just like leave us alone? Like we don't want to talk about it. And they're like covering mm. up their face and everything. Mm. And it made me so fucking angry. Like you spoiled fucking brats. Mm -hmm. Like these mm -hmm. white, affluent liberals in the Northeast one of the wealthiest towns in the country who have probably never wanted for a single thing in your lives, you know, who that. find yeah. it somehow don't have the capacity in their brains to see that, yes, bombing Gaza into rubble is wrong. And so is orphaning a three-year-old and then holding that three-year-old hostage is also wrong. Like are unable, like what is wrong with you like not only is that I'm, I'm, I'm going into the tirade that i drafted now not <laughs> only is that mm. kind of activism i say in air quotes just misguided and and it, it's just lazy yeah you know like let me it rip is. down this posters of these hostages and then we're gonna go have brunch but at least if you're gonna be confronted by it at least have the balls to defend your actions yeah you know yeah, exactly don't just then shut down and i don't want to talk about it because i've seen i've seen other similar things where people being confronted for having very questionable banners at protests and then they're like oh i, I don't want to talk about politics I'm not here to talk about politics well, well hang on a minute yeah, you just made a political I, I, it, statement it, well, you know. it yeah. really just short-circuited something in yeah, me and i no. was like i need i need a break um, yeah i i feel you man because I, I for me it's been instagram uh a lot of people mm -hmm. are i because again, like you know, a lot of my friend base or people I follow are usually filmmakers, photographers, musicians, and there's been one or two I've had to unfollow because they've just indulged in um, horrific. Um, uh, what's the word I want now? Uh, apology for or justification for the Hamas attacks. Yeah, just the mental um, contortionist yeah. to sort of excuse or minimize yeah. what Hamas did. And to me, that's my red line, you know, and, and I just can't tolerate that shit because I just, I'm not going to necessarily, maybe, you know, I mean, I could end up in endless arguments with people. I probably should hold people to account, but I just, I, I feel like my, my view has been, I'd rather make content like what we've been doing than yeah. get into silly arguments for people I barely yep. know um, exactly. or, or try and avoid, you know, um, and, and if, if there are people I know personally, then obviously I tend to have a quiet word with them when possible in person because I'm starting to try and have a lot less confrontations online. There's a survey that's been going around just recently um, about how something like 70 percent of 70 plus percent of Palestinians agree with the attacks. And I think the problem is that survey is done under duress. Um, yeah. you know, it's a bit like the elections in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. He he got like ninety nine percent of the vote. You know, <laughs> when you get a, a poll with Putin has like ninety some odd percent, but if you yeah. say you don't support him, you get thrown in a jail in Siberia. Exactly, and I think I think people need to take that into account. When the problem is now, I think we're in a stage where people are trying to find information that um backs up what their initial thought was. And I, I I've caught myself out a couple of times getting into that situation where you suddenly find things. Like, oh my god, that does this or does that and you're like no no take a take a chill pill for a minute and yeah. like consider you know who, what the background the person is is saying it and stuff and that's my my little and my little personal rule now is any and, and it has been for years now anytime i read an article that gives me an emotional reaction i pause and then double check who's writing it um where they're coming from maybe even the publication it's in um yeah because just once you in a while, look at you don't... the sourcing of the article too. Yeah, yeah, because you can sometimes surprise yourself because you know good writers can um, make all sorts of things that actually are quite questionable sound reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got to be careful. So you know, uh, and then when one in in a heightened emotional state, your I think your um, scruples go down a bit, um, and, and you can suddenly end up sharing something you shouldn't. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, I hope people don't think I'm, I'm now sort of saying that people, um, 
you know, at the same time, people who are indulging in rampant anti-Semitism, uh, just making mistakes. No, I think there's some people out there who know what the hell they're doing. Uh -huh. um, and they're just indulging in absolutely abhorrent, uh, abhorrent behavior. And there's been one or two people, it's been one or two actors have been, um, who've lost their jobs, like the actress from Scream, who's just suddenly been fired. I saw that yesterday, for, yeah. I don't know what she said. It was in Hollywood. Was it Hollywood Reporter or Variety? One of the two. I think it was Variety. One of the trades. Mentioned um, that she went one step further and started talking about the Jewish control of the media. And it was like, oh, Ooh, dear. Oh, dear. Now you've done no, 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 it. That's, yeah, you know, no. Now you've gone into anti-Semitism, you know. Because yeah. it is, is, look, you can criticize any country. This is the one thing I've always found fascinating about Israel. Like, if let's say France or America or Britain does something bad, you know, you can say America, France, Britain did X and it's terrible. But you don't then need to go, oh, but then France, Britain or America should never exist and you should get rid of it and blah, blah, blah. Because this is what tends to happen with Israel. Israel does something and people then say whatever it is that they don't like and then they add oh but israel should be destroyed should be this should be that and it kind of that's when you get into the territory of hate and anti-semitism and other things too and it always happens with comments about israel every time and there's so many people who should know better um who probably even could be an example to others who manage to always screw it up and and that unfortunately that actress in particular um if what she said as reported is true then she's made a terrible error that might well affect her career now because the thing is, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know, it might not, but but it, it, it's like you mean you've got words to be careful, have consequences. They do, they do, especially when it's um, you know gets wow. into hate crime territory. There's no real yeah. excuse for it. Um, so people do need to just bloody check what they're saying, um, not in a way to hide what your true thoughts are, but just don't fall into hate crime category, please. You know, um, I, yeah, it, it's just, I don't know. So yeah, crazy times. <laughs> Is there anything yeah. else you want to add on that? Cause no, I think it, just, to, just to tie off kind of what we said here, a kind of depressing conversation. I think this, this article is, is very hopeful and, yes. and even minded. And I wish everyone involved thought the way Mr. John Aziz does. Yeah. Well, there's one uh, final article. Actually, there's two more articles you wanted to chat about, isn't there? So there's political dysfunction and then Ukraine is nuclear weapons. So yeah, uh, following, I guess, we've talked about maybe a lot this episode, the the symptoms of of this political kind of dysfunction in our in our culture and how this conflict has kind of really brought it out the kind of media literacy and the 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 siloing and the and the tribalism that kind of just exacerbates all the worst tendencies that we have um so there's an op-ed uh, that Max Boot did. I'm sure a lot of people listening are at least familiar with him and have read stuff of his before. Um, I don't always agree with anything, everything he says. He's kind of a bit to the to to the right of me, but I I do think he he's he's at least reasonable and and decent and makes good mm, points. Mm. So he has an op-ed in the Washington Times out that says uh, political dysfunction, not China, is the greatest threat. To the United States, and I'm going to read a couple points, and then I'll, I'll um, go to you, Chris, and, and, and then give my thoughts on it. Uh, so the article argues that despite concerns about the decline of U.S. power, the greatest threat comes from domestic political dysfunction rather than external forces, particularly China. Mm -hmm. It highlights a history of failed predictions about the decline of U.S. power, mentioning past perceived threats from the Soviet Union and Japan. So of course, Japan would have been in like you know the 80s when we thought that like they were going to just buy up everything. Boot contends that political dysfunction poses a significant risk, citing examples such as the mishandling of military nominees and uh, potential government shutdown. So that's uh, Tommy Tuberville, um, senator from Alabama, who's held up hundreds of Department of Defense nominees oh, wow. over the yeah. past couple months. Um, and it's still a bit of a stalemate. They've gotten some through, but mm. it's still a problem. And you still got... Um, a lot of situations we haven't got ambassadors in certain countries still haven't you that's true we didn't have yeah. a i don't know if we for a while at least when the attack happened we have not had an ambassador in israel i still think we yeah i'm not sure uh, yeah there's one has since been approved because we had this huge crisis and they were like yo asshole we need an ambassador in israel anyway i digress um so the article emphasizes that the U.S.'s current global leadership in addressing crises like Gaza and Ukraine um, 
contrasting it with China's relatively passive stance. Uh, military capabilities are discussed with the U.S. having a significant advantage over China and Russia in terms of nuclear submarines, aircraft carriers, and defense spending. Economically, the U.S. still holds a strong position, contributing 25 percent to the global economy, with the majority of the top companies being American. And uh, it expresses concern about a rising isolationist movement in the in the U.S., especially if certain political figures, such as Donald Trump, return to power, potentially abandoning alliances like NATO and leaving Ukraine to be slaughtered by the Russians. Um, and finally, Boot warns that internal political divisions and an isolationist approach may pose a greater threat to U.S. global mm. power than external challengers like China mm. or Russia. Mm. Uh, Chris, what did you think about this? Yeah, again, a very good article, um, and I think it makes a good point on what actual power the U.S. does have in comparison to China and Russia, because um, in during the war on terror, it was very fashionable to predict the decline of American power and you know end of America, and America's endured a lot and still around and still pretty much the number one superpower. Um, and I think you know the article points out nicely that the isolationism that we see in the America kind of first movement today has its roots in World War Two. And what was then the American first movement then that's now been refashioned by Trump. Do you sense a pattern that these sort of isolationist movements in the United States should have come to the fore just before the outbreak of a world war? Does that seem kind of spooky to you right now? Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been like it, I'm so going back to like the 9-11 truther movement. I mean, it was. What sort of mainstream via Trump now was pretty much the sort of things that were going on in on the fringes in the 9-11 oh, movement yeah. with those sort of isolationist attitudes like and stuff. Buried That's, deep in internet yeah. message boards, but not amplified yeah, out by yeah. Elon Musk on social media. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you end up in this broad church of far right and far left, because both the far left and the far right are quite isolationist for different reasons. Yeah. Um for the far right, it's sort of they don't want to mix with foreigners and don't want foreigners in their lands, whilst the far left it's sort of more about um, it's just more about a little less conflict and less global projection of power and things like that. And so, um, so they you, they make these sort of very strange bedfellows. As we end up with like Code Pink and people like that who uh, end up excusing all sorts of terrible things and regimes and stuff. Um, and and so, yeah. And is this it being certainly um, growing? sort of blaming America for the world's troubles first before anybody else that's been become very fashionable, certainly in my lifetime. I think it existed before the war on terror, certainly in the 60s and 70s and 80s in certain factions. That was very popular. Um, and America's no saint, but I don't think America's necessarily single-handedly responsible for all the world's problems. Um, Absolutely. The Cold War took two to tango, um, as does the <laughs> world problems today with Russia, China, and America. Um, and I think, so what what... It struck me, and again, we sort of talked about this earlier, was I feel like there's been this growing apathy and self-destructive attitude in regards to politics. It's very popular with younger generations and even people of my age. Um, and I don't think it started with Generation Z, and I don't think it started with millennials. I think it actually possibly goes back to, well, it certainly goes back to World War II, but I think it also goes back to like post the Kennedy assassination, post Watergate, where this yeah. sort of slow burn of cynicism about the way society is run um, has sort of seeped in and it's Distrust sort of replaced measured yeah and it's sort of replaced measured political action and it, and we're sort of seeing extremes of right and left kind of coming together more and more on some levels and then fracturing on others too um and one thing i found with the right and the, so the sort of political right and political left they tend to get more and more divided and start to come up with more and more reasons to justify their di division um real and imagined and i think um on the left one attitude i found quite interesting and becoming much more commonplace than it used to be um because i used to when i was younger i think i was on the fringe of things whilst now the things that were fringe are becoming more mainstream but there's been this weird attitude about there are people on the left who think it's noble not to vote and not to participate in mainstream politics because apparently participating in voting or giving an actual shit about how your country's run is considered right wing. Um, and I think, again, like with this sort of anti-capitalist stuff, I think anti-capitalists or people who fall into that ideology just want to destroy capitalism no matter the cost. And they'll deal with everything else later. Um, and, and I've certainly seen a lot of that um, on a lot of leftist movements over the years. And it's sort of I, I felt that I feel like when you get 
an extreme right wing um, sort of president in or uh, prime minister, the far left get far more traction um, during that time until a more moderate left wing politician becomes in power. Um, and about then Corbyn. the far left. Yeah, like so you end up with so if you had yeah, so like with what I've noticed with um Biden, I think where he, he has issues now is because he's quite a moderate, a lot of um a lot of the kind of house on fire feeling that we had during the Trump administration yeah. has subsided. It's coming back, but it's currently subsided. And I think and I think what it's doing is it's it's giving the far left less legitimacy now than it had during Trump. Um and I think the far left thrive off Trump, as do the far right thrive off a moderate person like Obama because a lot of the Trumpian politics that we saw come together um, for his first term all had its roots in the Obama administration. So I think the far right and the far left kind of feed off each other. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where one of the issues comes in. And I, th and I think just as a center leftist, I think there's a huge blind spot on the left with to the um dealing with leftist extremism and some of the ideas that I think are becoming very dysfunctional, the anti-capitalism ideas that are getting more and more mainstreamed. And I even have a controversial thought on anti-racism. I'm starting to wonder whether white supremacy is just a new word for capitalism. Um, I'm starting to wonder that. Uh, it would be wrong to, it would be wrong to, to change the definition in that way. But mm, I, mm. I, I, I don't disagree with you, but if you're correct, mm. it would mm. be wrong to do that because they're not the same mm. thing. And no, there's plenty no, to but... be said that like, mm. I mean, over my lifetime and I think my generation has absolutely seen this and it's borne the brunt of it. I mean, yeah, there are aspects of capitalism as far as inequality and stuff, the cost of housing, oh, yeah. you know, that has just absolutely failed. But does that yeah. mean that, you know, that we should give up private property and stuff? No. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is it. And there are people out there who I think are just a bit deluded. Who like I saw this in 2014 with sort of um wasn't Jeremy Corbyn himself, but it was some of the people he was surrounding himself with. I filmed a talk he did. And most of the people, uh, apart from him, were very explicitly pro-Brexit, um, from a left-wing yeah. persuasion. And most of their justification for being pro-Brexit was because it sticks it to capitalism, basically, is what they were saying. They were saying it will destroy capitalism. Yeah. And it's like, that is so destructive because the cost of Brexit, which we live in now in the UK, with growing inequality, with, you know, certain rights are suddenly um, less, uh, you know, less of a sure thing than they were. Um, you know, I think it was so destructive and to just be the only justification for it is to be, you know, it's because of capitalism. I think it will being anti-capitalist. I think it's ridiculous. And this is, I think, the thing that the left needs to seriously sort out because it's sort of getting, it's getting dysfunctional and it's leading to worse and worse problems and it's going to just make matters, yeah, unlivable yeah. sooner or later. Good point. So I think that's, that's, that's the, the leftist problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to sort of add on to what mm. Max said as far as kind mm. of the military balance, right? Mm. That we mm. maybe have or are or are losing a bit. So here's here's kind of what I thought. I, I think that the recognition of American unipolar dominance in the world was never the norm until 30 years ago. And I think it's hubris, arrogance, and naivety to assume or expect that this status quo, I mean, Pax Americana, if you want to call it, you know, can or should be sustained like indefinitely. Um, and I think in a way, you know, we've always fretted about losing our sort of military, diplomatic, and economic edge. You know, I mean... During the Cold War, it was Sputnik, uh, the Red Scare, the Missile Gap, the Bomber Gap, uh, the 70s oil embargo, Star Wars, etc., you know? And I think looking back with clarity on this period of history, we know those concerns were unfounded yeah. to a great extent, right? I mean, the Soviets were never close to outmatching us, uh, and they bankrupted themselves trying to do so, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. So I think After Ukraine's... A case in point now as well yes their competence military wise yeah right absolutely um i think in the defense industry right now i think there's much hand-wringing about the u.s falling behind russia and china china especially mm. 
in stealth technology, hypersonic missiles, naval force, naval force posture, stuff like that. I think some of that concern is absolutely warranted. But I mean, after 9-11, great power competition, like facing a near-peer adversary, was not our focus. I mean, the threat didn't have advanced air defenses or blue water navy. So the tax dollars naturally kind of flowed into the intelligence spe and, and special operations community. And I think, you know, we're, we're making up for lost time now. You know, you think some of the developments that are coming down the pipeline right now, like a successor to the SR-71, mm. the next generation air dominance fighter and stuff, are like that's all coming online now and I think is our capabilities yeah. that we need that we're going to get there, yeah. you know. Yeah. There um, is one issue with that in yeah. terms of um, the length of time it takes to procure or make something that's got sure. really out of over the top. And in the UK, yeah. we suffer from this. We've got um, like a nuclear submarine that's broken that can't get into a dry dock and has, has been stuck waiting to be repaired for months and it's only two you years guys old. don't have that many of them. No, it's ridiculous. And it's this tried is Trident class, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was a was it a Vanguard? I think it was a Vanguard okay. class. Was and it was it's just becoming a bit dysfunctional, you know, because obviously during World War Two we were making a lot of ships, but now it takes years to build anything, and it's um, yeah, yeah. it's becoming yeah. a bit problematic. Right, but I mean, I think it's also worth sort of keeping in mind that mm. what we now know is always true during the Cold War that we were never behind is. Ultimately, I think likely also true now. I mean, I think near peer or peer adversaries make great buzzwords for think tanks, for defense contractors, for Pentagon elves. But I think Russia's performance in Ukraine, I think, should leave us questioning if such a thing exists. I mean, I think the U.S. military today is unlike any armed force or even any organized entity that has ever existed in the history of mankind. I mean, our total capacity, I'm not sort of romanticizing this i'm just stating an objective fact right i'm not saying that this is this is like yeah we're fucking the best this is an objective fact right i think our total capacity to conf to confront to kill to destroy is unfathomable um i think it would leave our jaws on the floor to actually really see it in practice and i think we should hope we never do um I think very few people, to include the vast majority of Americans who've never served in the military, I think truly understand our capabilities. Um, I think in most of our lifetimes, we've never faced an adversary that would warrant a display of such power. I mean, like the force we brought to bear against the Axis in World War II isn't even a fair one-to-one -one comparison of what we can do today. Um, I think like, remember the shock and awe campaign when we like rained down like 500 cruise missiles and over a thousand airstrikes on Baghdad in just a couple of nights. I mean, that was just a fraction of what we were capable then. And that was 20 years ago. Um, and I think whether it's morally right or fiscally responsible for any country to possess such power is a worthy debate. But the fact is we do, I think merit militarily, we are without peer and I don't see that changing anytime soon that is unless we allow ourselves to succumb to the ignorance to the obstinance to the tribalism ingrained in our cavemen dna that has been weaponized by a loud and persistent minority in this country mm. a minority that loves to celebrate and fetishize the unrivaled power their actions looking at you senator tupperville mm -hmm. threaten to unravel that's how i feel about that don't fuck with us. You want to find out why we don't have healthcare? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just you need to now have healthcare. I think. <laughs> yeah, let's well, try to do both. I think you benefit from it. I think with the the um, should we say uh, massive American spend on weapons and stuff. I mean, the thing is, you put it into proportion from an America has to have those weapons on standby to defend a lot of the allies. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just for America. You guys, it's for yeah, it's for internet, it's for, it's for you nuclear guys umbrella, etc. Um, and, I, and I know there's been like growing debate about whether Europe could and should do more and whether Britain could should do more and even I Canada, who, you know, because Canada are even saying they can't make their 5% NATO obligation now. Um, and I think I think for many years, a lot of people, I think post-Cold War, people just got a bit complacent and, and have relied too much on America. Um, but at the same time, America can't afford to get complacent either because if they do let things deteriorate, then... 
you know, a small threat today or an unrealistic threat today could be a very realistic threat in 10, 20 years' time. You know, uh, lessons from World War Two there where Britain... Um, you know, went through a long period of not, um, you know, renewing their forces and stuff. And so when a superior force and the Germans did finally show up, um, we we struggled for a while to get our shit together um, and had to ask for help from America, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so there is a, you know, there is a reason why all those things. But yes, it definitely could be streamlined and better. But yeah. Yeah, I think if we if we went to war with China tomorrow... Or at any point in the next maybe five to ten years, I think in the beginning it would be very dicey. It would be legitimately frightening for us. It would be a scale of conflict that we just have not seen. I think there's a high likelihood that we could lose a carrier um, in the Western Pacific. And I mm. think it would sort of touch us back home on a fundamental level in a way that had, we have not been touched since World War II. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think I think we would win. And I don't yeah. think it would be particularly close. Yeah. Well, let's hope. Let's hope it never gets to that. But um, no. Yeah. Yeah. It does. I don't know. It has this horrible. I'm trying to work this out actually because there's this sort of feeling of inevitability at the moment with a conflict with China, and I'm trying to work out: is it inevitable because we think it is, or is it actually inevitable? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to work out. Well, I think I. I mean, there's been a lot of preparation in the last, mm. you know, five years or so to make the war winnable, whether mm. that's moving, you know, chip production outside of Taiwan, yeah. you know, whether that's building up bases in Australia, um, in in moving more stuff into Japan and everything, trying to kind of prepare and and minimize the effects that the war would have on us so that it's survivable. But I think there's a sort of double-edged sword to that, that in doing, in making the war more survivable, mm. you make it more likely that it happens. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. I was just, recently, I was just pondering on it because it just suddenly, I don't know, in the last sort of 10 years or so, I mean, it, it's one of these things where it probably might or will happen but it, i was trying to work out why there is this sort of feeling of inevitability now that there maybe wasn't 10 years ago and i was just trying to work out yeah. whether it's self-fulfilling prophecy or something else so yeah no it's an interesting I don't know. one i i i don't think it's a given i don't think it's inevitable no. No. um but it's not something to just dismiss is like nah that can't happen well no exactly I yeah, yeah, and I think it's always a danger where we assume ah, it can't happen, but it can. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> it's easier a failure yeah. of imagination that leads to terrible things being allowed to happen. Well, look, um, let's move on to maybe failure of imagination in our last one, um, uh, which is the deal yeah. that led to Ukraine losing its nuclear arsenal. So this is a um, an interesting article. It's a uh, it's a long read. Um, you know, if you're at home for the holidays, you know. Um, in the next couple of weeks or so, and you you uh, have some time. I think this is definitely worth your while. Um, but it's an article in the National Interest by George Bogdan. Um, it's called "Deceit, Dread, and Disbelief: The Story of How uh, Ukraine Lost Its Its Nuclear Arsenal." And uh, some couple points from it. So it says uh, the U.S. and NATO pressured Ukraine to give up the remaining um, nuclear weapons on its soil after the collapse of the Soviet Union, despite the risk of Russian aggression, as newly released archival files reveal. Uh, the files challenge beliefs about Ukraine lacking technical means for maintaining and operating nuclear weapons. The article argues that the Budapest Memorandum, signed in 1994, uh, provided hollow security assurances in exchange for Ukraine's nuclear disarmament, later contributing to Russia's decision to invade in 2022. Um, records show U.S. officials hindered Ukraine's attempts to trade its nuclear arsenal for genuine security guarantees, possibly due to back-channeling with Moscow. These officials were more interested in integrating Russia into the Western democratic world than providing security guarantees for Ukraine. I think ultimately the Budapest Memorandum's true story is, this is what the article says, that ultimately the Budapest Memorandum's true story is one of great powers negotiating over a vulnerable nation's fate, disregarding protests and legitimate concerns about regional security. So, Chris, before mm. I sort of give my thoughts on this, I wanted to know what 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 you thought about matter. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I think like you, I think it kind of points this out, but maybe it misses the context a little bit. I mean, nuclear disarmament was a huge deal and priority in the nineties. Um, yes. So I can understand why some politicians thought that this was a good idea. You know, the Cold War was over, and this was the first opportunity to start reducing the spread of nuclear weapons. And on top of that, there's been this very strong desire was to bring Russia in from the cold and do business with them. This idea of doing business with a former adversary makes it less likely they'll want to shoot at you in the future i think was the ideology behind that and the problem is this pursuit has led to policy makers turning a blind eye to many things and over time that those things allow putin to push his agenda unchecked for you know almost decades now um and the overriding political philosophy is if we do business with russia and get them into doing the western way of things then there will be peace and russia would be content but obviously in hindsight this did not work and it shows um and I think it shows for a few things. One, the desperation of successive U.S. administrations to appease Russia. And I think also it sort of shows how wildly they underestimated Russia and their own desires to rebuild and regroup after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the loss of the Eastern Bloc countries uh, that were once in their grip. I think many U.S. policymakers just sort of completely ignored that. Um and I think that's what's led to this sort of situation today, and I think this article completely confirms all that. Really, it's it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to, I I wanted to sort of really dig into this a bit. I mm. mean, I've seen it sort of. I'm going to be a bit of a, a contrarian here. I, I've seen it sort of, um, post a bit as kind of like a given that like yeah, this was a mistake. You know, we should have let Ukraine keep its nuclear weapons. I think. Those were well intended, and I, I that that view is 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 well intended. Um, I think honestly, though, it it suffers from a bit of recency bias. You know, like Ukraine has been invaded, and it's suffering under parts of the country are suffering under brutal occupation. Other parts are being bombed. You know, um, without any kind of regard for the civilians who who live there and stuff, and it's generally a, 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 a terrible situation. So I think it's right to sort of question. You know how could this have been avoided you know and that's sort of a natural thing to reach to and i totally understand that but i sort of wanted to sort of take a step back i mean that's it the, the position for me anyway that ukraine should have kept its news is just i can't get behind it and i wanted to sort of take a step back and look at the totality of the situation sort of explain why right so i, I mean yeah i think this is a very interesting article and um definitely goes into the US and Ukraine's different differing priorities and stuff at the end of the at 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 the end of the Cold War. There's a lot of worthy questions there. Um I still doubt though that allowing Ukraine to keep its nuclear weapons would have been wise. I think it takes a it 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 takes a colossal amount of scientific expertise and industrial capability to safely maintain these weapons so that they can remain a credible deterrence. I mean and sure the article talks a lot about there's a high likelihood that Ukraine could have done this, you know, at the time. They could have maintained these weapons. I mean, so like the physics package at the part that goes boom inside these bombs are like notoriously kind of temperamental. And like if just one component malfunctions, it's a dud, you know, it's a very complex, highly technical, advanced thing to get right. And if you don't get it right, you might as well not have them at all because they won't work, right? I mean, I think at the same time, the economic situation in Ukraine was, and, and throughout the post-Soviet space in the 90s, was incredibly dire. I think yeah. political corruption and mismanagement during that period was endemic. And, you know, while Ukraine technically may have been able to maintain its nukes, I question if they would have remained secure. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Because that was the uh, big fear in the 90s, was loose right. nukes being sold on the black market. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I mean, so the Pentagon and the intelligence community scoured that region for loose fissile mm. material and poured tons of resources into ensuring the security of Russia's mm. uh, nuclear arsenal and civilian power program. And I mean, so let's remember also our failed efforts around this same time to dissuade Pakistan from building a bomb. You know, so this is a country that definitely had the scientific and industrial base to maintain them. But their political instability left serious concerns that their ability about their ability to keep them safe. I mean, and that remains a concern today. Like JSOC has extensive contingency plans to seize Pakistan's nukes if they ever collapse. Like so Delta Force was once filmed training with Little Bird helicopters to land operators on the top of an 18-wheeler uh, speeding down a highway. 
Like, what do we, what do, what do we think that's for? You know, um, I think the principle of non-proliferation efforts have always been the belief that the fewer countries possess nukes, the fewer the chances for a miscalculation, an accident, or one falling into the wrong hands. And I think, given the cost of failure here, it it would have been irresponsible to compromise on this for a shot of realpolitik to deter the Russians. I mean, and this this will sound harsh. And of course, in this moment, I fully support them and want to help them in every way we possibly can so they can beat the Russians' asses. But I think, frankly, the stakes here were bigger than just Ukraine. It was potentially the survival of the human race. Um, and this was a serious concern. I, I've told this story a lot. I don't remember if I've told it on this podcast before, but in 2010, um, I was sent to the Naval Academy Foreign Affairs Conference um, I was on a like a three or four day roundtable about the use of weapons of mass destruction in the 21st century. I presented a paper about deterrence theory and how it doesn't really work. Again, when you're dealing with like you know terrorist groups or regimes run by religious zealots who don't really care if they die. I digress. Anyway, our advisor on this roundtable was a professor at the Naval Academy who worked in this space for the State Department um, at the time, right? And uh, one of the nights, uh, Robert Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time, came and gave the keynote address to the conference. And we had a big dinner for him at the same time, right? And uh, my group was all stood at a table together, and I was right next to her. Um, I won't say her name because she's still there. Um, but uh, this was, you know, we'd all had like a, a glass and a half of wine at this point. Sounds like a good night. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and the Secretary of Defense is like right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I asked her about, you know, these rumors that were sort of reported a lot in the 90s and the early 2000s and stuff. Like there was a GRU defector, Alexander Lebedev, I think his name was, who said, you know, that these um, the Russia had built these sort of man portable suitcase nukes, mm. that they had lost them and stuff. And it was always sort of yeah. debated how credible yeah. he was and everything, right? So, yeah, after like a glass and a half of wine, I sort of turned and I said, you know, is there is there any truth to yeah. that story. You know, yeah. she worked yeah. in this sort of non-proliferation yeah. space at the time. What do you think? Yeah, good opportunity to ask that question. Yeah. yeah. And and she told me, all I can say is, they lost things, and we found them. And the core plot of active measures was built off that single sentence. And I still think about that all the time, what might have been and what we might have avoided. Mm. And I think Ukraine's lack of a nuclear deterrence, to sort of pull back from that, I think Ukraine's lack of a nuclear deterrent was not the only factor in Putin's decision mm. to invade. Mm. I mean, other actions such as, yeah, I've talked about this on here before, perhaps a Marshall Plan for Russia and the former Soviet states could have prevented the sort of regional economic collapse and national humiliation that gave rise to Putinism. And I think while it's easier to look back with 2020 vision and try to point to one decision as a key factor to led to the situation that we find ourselves in today. Mm. But I think the truth is that many mistakes and missed opportunities over the last 30 years brought us here. Yeah. I, it's, it's important, though, that we keep in mind that there were other timelines that could have been much, much uglier. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And just building what you're saying there, I think, you know, had Ukraine still had the weapons, I'm sure Putin would have factored that into his plans and his special forces would have neutralized them or whatever. Um so yeah, I yeah, I think you're right. I think the yeah, that that desire in the 90s to sort of stop uh, the spread of nuclear weapons was a noble one. Um and I think the problem is now I think even more countries are wanting nuclear power and nuclear weapons i think you know we're getting a situation again where there might be far more nuclear weapons in 20 years time than there are now i think even america um now considering uh building a whole new fleet of missile man is it uh, minute man missiles or something we're, in um, russia yeah to we're, do we're testing again apparently actively developing a successor mm. to the minute man system which has been in use i think since the 70s and at the same time um china is rapidly building up its own nuclear arsenal sort of like warp speed um yeah so it is it is still a, a serious concern mm. you think you know the cold war is over you know it's not going to happen it's, we're still we're still kind of there yeah. yeah i i still think though about what that that one sentence that she answered with mm. they lost things we found them and to me that was just 
bone chilling about what we still quite don't know. And yeah, I've spent the the last 13 years writing off of that single sentence. Mm. Mm, no, it's powerful stuff. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, food for thought there. So thank you for that, Matt. Well, look, yeah. I think we're going to move on to um, Extra Shot. Yep. <laughs> the name of our own show. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to move on to Patreon and on to Extra Shot. So uh, if you want to join us over there, just go to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies. Pick the subscription level that works for you, and then you can join us on Extra Shot. If you're not going to join us, um, I just want to say I hope you have, uh, if you're listening in America, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you're not listening in America, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, and we will be back on Saturday, the 9th of December. And uh, yeah, and we will catch you then. So thank you for listening. Just one quick, one quick addendum if we leave. If you're not in America and you want turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing and cranberry sauce and all that good stuff, you can find it. There's no law saying you can't, you can't have that. That is true. And prep so. do very good Christmas sandwiches too. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there we go. There we go. We don't, don't worry about loose nukes. It's loose turkeys you've got to worry about this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody, for listening yep. and take care. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. <laughs>